So this video is going to be pretty different from most of the videos I do. This is not going to be an installation. This is going to be me sharing what I've learned about how not to die when your boat's plugged into shore power. Does that sound a little clickbaity and over the top? Maybe, but it's true. So most boaters are familiar with your standard uh, North American circuit breaker. This is a simple 20 amp Carling Tech, uh, I think Blue Sea sells them, circuit breaker. And its job is simply to make sure your wires don't catch fire. They monitor the amount of current going through and if it, if it exceeds what it's designed for, it pops the breaker, breaks the circuit and stops the current flow, saving your wires from turning into igniters. Almost as many people will be familiar with a GFCI, a ground fault circuit interrupter. This one is an electrical outlet. You can also get GFCI breakers, but for now we'll set that aside, literally. The idea behind a GFCI is that it's measuring the amount of current coming in the hot, the line, and coming out the neutral, the white wire. And hot is black in North America, white is neutral in North America. So the power comes in the black and comes out the white. And for the purposes of this video, let's not get into the debate about which direction does electricity actually flow. Doesn't really matter to this conversation. So what these do is they're watching to see that the amount of current leaving the neutral is the same as the amount of current coming in the hot or the supply. If there is a delta of more than five milliamps, these will pop and they'll break the circuit. When you have one of these outlets as a branch circuit protection, you put this as the first outlet on the circuit and it provides GFCI protection for all the circuits further down the branch. Obviously, if you have a GFCI breaker, that protects the whole circuit as well. But in either case, it's only protecting the branch circuit. Now, this begs the question, what could cause a delta? When I was trying to understand this, I had the image in my head of an old-fashioned paddle wheel, like a water wheel that you would see back in the 1800s. You have your main river going by, and you have a branch that comes off that diverts some of the water down a little canal, spins the wheel, it comes out the other side, and then rejoins the main branch, the main river, whatever it is you're pulling the water from. When everything's working perfectly and there's no leaks, the amount of water coming in and the amount of water coming out is the same. It comes, transfers some of its energy into the wheel, slows down, but the same volume comes out the other side. If you were to measure how many liters per second were coming into the channel and how many liters of sec per second were coming out of the channel, and you found that there was less water coming out the end, you could logically surmise there has to be a leak somewhere. Your canal has a crack in it, it's leaking, something's wrong. Now, in the case of a water wheel, uh, who cares? In the case of electricity, it could kill you. How could it kill you? If you're in the bathtub and somehow accidentally bring your toaster into the tub with you, some of the current that's coming into the hot side is going to travel through the water into your tub, through the piping, and find an alternative path to ground. You, being in the water, would experience some of that current and it does not take very much to kill you. So the way this works is because some of the current would be going through the water, through the piping and down into the ground, the amount of power coming out of the neutral would be less than the amount of power going into the hot and that's gonna trip the breaker. It's gonna cut off the power almost instantly. I think it's uh, 100 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, something like that. An ELCI, Equipment Leakage Circuit Interrupter, known in Europe as an RCD, a residual current device. It does act like a current limiter, like a traditional circuit breaker. If too much current goes through, it pops. Pretty bog standard. What makes it different is it has a little sensor on it that you pass your hot and neutral lines through to your load. And then it has this pigtail that also connects to the load's neutral. And using those, it can also measure the power coming and going and making sure that they're equal. Where a GFCI trips if there's a 5 milliamp difference, these trip if there's a 30 milliamp difference. So these are, you could argue, basically whole boat instead of branch circuit protection 
and this has a wider tolerance than this does, which reduces the chance of nuisance tripping. Being a nerd, I wanted to understand how this worked. And when I was looking up information on ELCIs and RCDs and how they protect you, I could find plenty of articles that pulled at the heartstrings, talking about children who've been killed. And I don't mean to sound like that's not a big deal. It is. There's really not much more tragic than a child dying. But it didn't scratch the itch of understanding what was the mechanism of threat? What was the mechanism of death? How does this actually save somebody from being harmed or killed? I think I've got it, and I want to share what I've learned with you. Now, before I do, to anyone who is not familiar with my channel, I am not an electrician. I am not an expert. I am sharing what I have learned. If I have made any mistakes, I am sure I'll be corrected in the comments. I have a fantastic technically literate audience. I will put any corrections into the description. So please, especially if you're watching this well after it's been released, look for errata in the description in case I've got anything wrong. With that caveat said, power always wants to get back to its source. So if you have water being diverted to go to this water wheel, it wants to eventually go downhill and rejoin the rest of the river. Pardon the analogy, it's a little bit stretched at this point, but hopefully it helps you understand that whatever current is sent out, it wants to get back to its source. It wants to create a complete circuit. You would never do this, but as a thought experiment, imagine that you had your hotline going out and you had two parallel neutral wires coming back. And those two parallel neutral wires had the same resistance. The current going out, say it was 30 amps, running this thing at full load, I would have 15 amps on either neutral because they have the same resistance, they provide the same path to ground from the electricity's perspective. If on the other hand, one wire is a much heavier gauge than the other one, the other one was a much smaller gauge and so had a higher resistance, more, if not most, of the current would be coming back through the heavy gauge wire but still a little would be coming back through the smaller wire. Electricity searches for the path of least resistance, but it doesn't take only that path. It takes a proportional percent of that path. So if you have a second path back to ground, even if it's a high resistance, poor conductor, some current is going to try to use it. And if you place something in that path, which has a lower resistance, the current is gonna flow through that, trying to get back to the path. So 30 amps is quite a high amount. You can be killed by 10 milliamps, which is why GFCIs have a five milliamp trip. Now, different people with different physiologies and different health conditions could be susceptible to injury or death at even lower numbers. But for the sake of this, we're going to say anything under um, 10 milliamps could kill you. Anything under 30 milliamps could more likely kill you. There's a debate as to whether these should be tighter in their tolerances, but if you have something that's tripping too many times because of a nuisance, people are going to bypass it or remove it. So they had to strike a practical balance and they came to 30 milliamps. At 30 milliamps, most healthy people will still be able to live, but there is a risk of death. Now, what are the mechanisms of death? If you have a situation where, a classic example would be a microwave. You have the hotline coming in, it's an old microwave, it's been damaged, it's been bashed around when you did an ocean crossing, and you didn't realize that the insulation on the hot wire has started to fray. And every now and then it's making contact with the chassis. And that means that some of the current is coming through ground rather than through neutral. Earlier I used two neutrals, but a neutral on the ground is still two paths to the source of power because they're bonded at the source. So some of the current is going into the frame of the microwave, which then goes to the ground, which goes to either your engine, if that's your common ground point on your boat, or like me, you have an electric boat and you have a ground plate. In either case, you have a piece of metal that's in the water that acts as the ground, and now you have current on it. When the current, when the voltage, voltage is a measure of potential difference between the source and the destination. So you have this piece of metal underneath your boat that it is a high potential. You have the earth, which is a low potential, and you have the water in between them. And the current wants to get from the high potential to the low potential. 
what ends up happening is you have a voltage gradient that comes out of your boat. Think of it kind of like how you drop a rock into the water. At the moment where the rock hits the water, you have an intense wave, but then it starts to spread out. And as it spreads out and gets larger, the amplitude of the wave gets shorter and shorter until it's almost unmeasurable. Electricity is doing the same thing. So if you have 120 volt potential at your vessel, somewhere between your vessel and the shore power, it's going to taper down like that wave to effectively zero volts. Here's where it can kill you. Here's where it can kill children or people who have other underlying health problems in particular. If you're in fresh water, and for those of you who live on salt water, you are not immune. Imagine a situation where there's been a heavy rainfall or you're near the estuary of a river. Fresh water will sit on top of salt water. So if you've had a bunch of water from rain run down and marinas are always on the shore, you could have a layer of fresh or brackish water sitting on top of the salt water. So this is something though, I'm talking about fresh water applies to people in salt water. Salt water is a relatively poor conductor. So you're going to have this voltage gradient. It's going to be looking for a path to ground. And now you come along and you swim into it. Your body is more like salt water. It is a much better conductor, conductor than fresh water. And being in the water, your normal skin resistance to electric flow is not really there, not to the same degree as it is when you're dry. I am 177 centimeters tall, five foot nine in, in freedom units. Let's round that to two, or to two meters, just for easy math. If the voltage gradient is more than six volts per meter or two volts per foot, then what can happen is if I am two meters tall, spherical cow with no resistance. So if I put my arms out and I'm in the water and one arm is close to the boat and one arm is close to the shore, so I'm perfectly perpendicular to the voltage gradient, and that voltage gradient is six volts per meter. What this means is that the two sides of my hands, one hand is sitting at a 12 volt higher potential than the other hand. So in that moment, the current, the electricity is gonna to wanna to flow from the 12 to the, well, effectively, I'm gonna have a 12 volt terminal in one hand and a zero volt terminal on another, like I've just grabbed a battery. And current is going to begin to flow because the path to the shore is now lower resistance through my body. My body is a conductor and it passes right through my chest where my heart is somewhere in here. That's going to generate enough current to stop my heart. But that doesn't have to be the only way that it kills you. It's not just causing you a heart attack because it's AC power. The voltage is going up to 120 down to minus 120 and back up again. Or thinking of it like this, the voltage is going back and forth, back and forth, meaning that it goes from 12 volt, zero volt, and then on every half cycle, 12 volt, zero volt, 12 volt, zero volt. And it's doing this 60 times a second in North America, 50 times a second in Europe. So this voltage is going to, this current is gonna flow through my body constantly. And that's gonna cause my muscles to lock up, meaning I can no longer swim. So even if it's not enough to stop my heart, if I lose control of my muscles and I slip below the water, I'm just as dead. This is something referred to as electric shock drowning, ESD. It is now believed that what was often considered simple drownings were probably ESDs. And the reason for that is in an autopsy, the current was so low that it doesn't cause any kind of burning or any of the other traditional telltales of somebody who suffered an electric shock. You just can't swim properly and you drown. Starting in 2013, ABYC in North America started requiring ELCIs on vessels as a way to combat these electric shock drownings. If you have a vessel like mine that is older than 2013, this probably doesn't exist. One of the things I want to also get across in this video is that these things in the world of boats aren't that expensive. I ordered mine directly from Carling Tech. I think it was, I think it's currently selling for 320 Canadian dollars now. Um, Blue Sea sells their branded version of these for I think four or five hundred dollars. They're not that expensive in the boating world and they really can save the life, especially of kids who happen to swim in the water near your boat. I, I know personally 
even though I'm doing all of my wiring on my boat and I'm confident I'm going to do it right, potentially arrogant, I would hate to find out I was wrong when I went out and found somebody floating beside my boat and it was my fault that I killed them. In the grand scheme of things, this makes this pretty cheap and pretty affordable. So tomorrow for me, I am going to install this on the boat. I am going to show how it's wired in. We'll be back to our normally regular scheduled broadcasting and you will see how this actually gets installed. Hopefully I do it right. But this video, I want to be a standalone video just on what an ELCI RCD is and how it protects you. I'm the Digital Mermaid. Uh, if you find this kind of stuff helpful or useful, can you do the YouTube thingy-bajigs? I'd much appreciate it. See you later. Distraction, my darling. An adorable, adorable distraction.